Okay, so we're recording now. Um, hello and welcome everybody. Hope you're keeping well. Um, my name is Brooklyn and I am the president of the LSCSU Music Society. Um, we're extremely excited to hold the speaker event, uh, Black Artists Experiences in the Music Industry, to celebrate Black History Month and commemorate the achievements and experiences of Black artists from a music perspective. This event, uh, as I've mentioned, will be recorded um, if there are no technical difficulties and uploaded to our YouTube channel after, so do bear this in mind. Um, so we do have four very distinguished musicians here today who will cross themselves present a diverse narrative of the experiences being in the music industry. Uh, so we have Maxwell D, who is a rapper, Nick Richards, a saxophonist, Winsome Duncan, a singer and author known professionally as Lyrical Healer, and Carl Jackson, organist and choir director. I hope you are all just as excited as I am uh, to listen to all the insights they have to offer tonight. So before we begin, uh, I'll give a quick rundown of the event and mention some housekeeping issues. So the four speakers will be taking turns following each other. Each speaker will have roughly 15 minutes. Uh, and after the last speaker has spoken, I'll kick off the Q&A session, which should last around 30 minutes. Uh, you're all more than welcome to clap and cheer for our wonderful panel tonight, but preferably behind muted microphones. So that is it for introductions. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker. So Nick Richards is an accomplished jazz saxophonist based in Leeds and is part of the Afro Jazz Music Collective, uh, Nubian Twist. He has performed both as part of the group and as a soloist in respectable occasions spanning the UK and the rest of Europe, including Glastonbury, South Bank Centre and Jazz à la Villette in Paris. He has also supported other celebrated artists such as Omar and Parliament Funkadelic. Since 2017, Nick has been training as a music therapist at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in London. Over to you, Nick. Wow, thank you, Brooklyn, for that introduction. I think you've certainly done your research. <laughs> I don't know, I've got 15 minutes of thing, things to say, but no, thank you very much for having me. Um, I think it's going to be a, a great reflective experience uh, for myself, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing the, the narratives of the other people on the panel. Um, yeah, so I, I spent the last couple of days thinking over you know, what would be the, you know, thinking about my experience and thinking about the most relevant parts of my experience to to this to this discussion. Um, and I was thinking initially around, you know, my experiences of working professionally as a saxophonist. I think actually a lot of my experience stemmed from my childhood and my training and actually the journey into becoming a, 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 um, yeah, a professional musician. Um, I think that's it's important to think about um, because it brings up a lot of things both from, for myself but I think there's a lot of things that maybe um, are pertinent to to this discussion um, adding on to to um, the great bio that you gave um, at the beginning um, so I was, I was born in Croydon um, but I grew up in a little town about 10 miles uh, south of Croydon um, a little town in um, Surrey um, but yes, I, I live in I live in Leeds now. Um, my mum's family uh, were originally from Yorkshire, and my dad's family originally from uh, Barbados. So um, I've grew up in a mixed um, mix mixed household, um, and I've had a kind of a mixed background. Um, so yeah, I'm I guess I am a saxophonist, um, a vocalist. A you know a composer and a arranger. Um, I think in the last ten years, I, I've really kind of tried to work the the grind of the music industry, and I think many of my experiences are similar to people from all sorts of backgrounds who are, who are doing this doing this profession right now. It's incredibly difficult, um, you know. And as you said, I, I, I work with Nubian Twist. I'd say that's my one of my key projects creatively um, but you know I'm also doing things like weddings and 
you know, all sorts of performing things. So it's not, um, I wouldn't say it's a very, um, it's always a very glamorous uh, profession, you know, it's um, very similar to, like I say, you know, it's no different to being a carpenter, you know, you've got, you've got your skills and you have to be able to do as many different things as, as, as you can. Um, so I think the performance side of things is about 50% of what I'm doing now. And as you quite rightly said, um, I did my music therapy training um, at the Guildhall School of Music in London. Um, and now I'm registered and I'm working professionally up in Leeds. Um, so I'll, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll touch on that in a, in a bit. Um, so some of my experiences um, when growing up, I didn't really get into, I didn't start my training until I was 12. Um, and I think, I think maybe perhaps I feel that was, that, that was a bit late, but I think that's, that was down to the opportunities that my, my, my parents could give me really. Um, when I was 12, they managed to get enough money to buy me my first saxophone. Um, and that was huge. You know, and I think across the board, having, uh, you know, parents or members of family or members of community who are going to get behind you and support you to take on this journey to become a professional musician is, is massive. And it was massive for me. Um, you know, my parents not only, you know, giving me the means to, to study music, but um, helping me to give, the, you know, giving me the confidence to, to pursue it and, and um, for me to be, you know, proud of myself also, of my identity. Um, you know, I think we talk a lot about diversity in, in the jazz scene at the moment. That's, I think that's what I can speak, speak about today because that's, what, that's the scene that I'm working in. And I think it is really, it's getting, you know, more and more diverse now. There seems to be all sorts of different schemes going on, but, I think an important thing to remember, like growing up in Surrey in the nine in the nineties, like um, you know, it wasn't diverse. You know, I was probably one of three black mixed race kids in in a, you know in my primary school and in my my secondary school. You know, talk about one thousand five hundred kids. So, you know, I think that is important to say because. Well, it, I think it I think it affects you in some ways, um, in a, in a profound way, and I, I don't think fifteen minutes is long enough to kind of talk about that. But um, I think you get very good at fitting in, and I think I think talking about the demographic of the area that I was growing up in is key, is important to think about because actually, when I was training and was doing my initial lessons. It wasn't diverse at all also you know i was going to wind orchestras um i was going to big bands and things like that um and and you know it it, it really wasn't diverse and there wasn't any one particularly who who looks looks like me in you know in these bands and things like that i think i was quite used to that as a child but you know now now that i reflect on it i think why was that the case you know why weren't there more children of my kind of background ac accessing music in that area? Um, so yeah, I think over the last couple of days when I've kind of been thinking about some of the things I wanted to talk about, I've been, been thinking about that, you know, why is it that certain people from certain backgrounds are, are still finding it difficult to access music? And I, and I hope through this discussion we can you know, find solutions and uh, to enable people from all backgrounds to access this amazing art form, whether it be through, you know, listening or through a hobby or playing professionally, you know, I think there needs, there's always more that needs to be done. Um, so my route into professional career, I guess, is not very unique in terms of there's a lot of jazz musicians my age at the moment who go through, you know, one-to-one -one tuition and then they go to conservatoire. And that's very competitive. And 
I decided to go to Leeds College of Music. Um, and that's where I really, you know, it, it became more diverse then all of a sudden. Um, and that was really, that felt really healthy. Um, and it was a chance for me to, you know, hone my skills as, 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 as a musician. And, you know, there's a lot of practice. It was quite rigorous. There was also the time where I got to meet the community that I play with now, you know, in London and in Leeds. And that was really important. I talk about it being more diverse, but actually thinking about it now, actually Leeds College, of, Leeds College of Music had one of the lowest um, intakes of female musicians. So when I went, it wasn't diverse in that aspect at all. Um, and I think now, you know, we're looking at the jazz scene and we've got the, you know, these, these great female led, black female led bands. Um, you, know, you know, I'm thinking about people like um, Cassie Kanoshi, you know, the Black Seed Ensemble, uh, Nubia Garcia. You know, that's, that's amazing. But I think, I don't know what their experiences were growing up, but it, it wasn't diverse when I, you know, when I was, when I was training. Um, so yeah, although Leeds College of Music was diverse in some ways, I think that there, there were some other things that needed to be done. Um, that was also the place where I met my bandmates, Nubian Twist. Um, what can I say about Nubian Twist? I think we'll play some music in a bit, um, but I, I mean, we're a 10 piece band, we're a multi multicultural band. There's people from Ireland, people from Brazil, um, you know, people from mixed heritage background like myself. Um, and, and that's, I think that's important. I think that's, um, that's felt healthy to me, actually. And I think music has been generally for me, a really important place where I can meet people from other cultures, where I can learn about other cultures, you know. Um, so the band is, it's been going for about 10 years. Um, and, you know, we're always trying to mix other musical genres as well, you know, whether it be jazz, um, Afrobeat, hip hop, um, and elements, I guess, of modern contemporary classical. Um, so maybe we could just play play a short short clip, Brooklyn. I think I think I sent you something, um, and maybe that's the, the easiest way to kind of get an idea, get your head around the music, and, and perhaps I'll I'll go from there. Okay. Yeah. So Nick um, recommended a track by Nubian Twist um, called Jungle Run, which. I'll play maybe the first two and a half minutes um, for you. Yeah. Um, there we go. Like a knife out of the 
if that's okay yeah yeah no that's fine that's fine um so i think maybe i should speak a bit about that track actually um this the, the rapper and the singer in, in in that tune is is nubia who was our original vocalist and the whole idea of the the jungle rum is was kind of the it's almost like the idea of 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 the kind of you know Bab kind of the Babylon and like the kind of the concrete jungle, but it was also about, you know, London as the place where, you know, people from all walks of life and all cultures can kind of, kind of mix. I think, um, I think this band for, for Nubia and, and I think for myself, it became a real, a real point for us to, a real space for us to kind of reflect on our identity um as as black mixed mixed race people and i think although i i don't feel like i've come up against as many challenges well i don't feel like i came up as many as many challenges as as, as her actually i think she she experienced some real kind of difficulties um in terms of this narrative around, you know, what, you know, what black musicians or what black female musicians can do, should they just be vocalists and things like that. And, and we had, we had really long conversations. So I think what, what I'm trying to say briefly is music and the band became very important for us, for our kind of our souls really to figure out who we were and, you know, discuss this narrative of, you know, you know how how we were feeling in society. So uh, I'm not sure if that makes complete sense, and maybe we'll, we'll discuss that further. But I'm trying. I'm still trying to unpick it. <laughs> yeah, I think it goes quite deep. Um. So yeah, this with this band. You know, I've got to play with some some of my my heroes, and um, like Tony Allen and Della Sassini. Um, we've said, shared the stage with George Clinton, like you said, and, and um, we've also worked with Malatu Estake on, on that same album. So it's, it's been a great, you know, learning experience, experience for me. And it's been, you know, a place where I can learn new musical forms and new musical cultures. So it's, it's you know, it's been, been a massive learning curve for me, but it's been healthy, I think. And it's really shown that you know, music is a place where, you know, we can learn about each other and we can share things. Um, yeah, I think we've been a very, very busy band and I think we have come up against some difficulties, I think, actually, recently. Um, and again, it goes back to the kind of perception of what a black musician is and um, and what they should be doing, and particularly females, female musicians. Um, so I, I won't name names, but I think we came up to a situation with our, some of our promoters in Europe um, who wouldn't book the band unless there was a black female lead. And, you know, we were getting to a point where these promoters weren't listening to the music. Um, and it, and it and it kind of got to a point where it almost felt like kind of tokenism, which felt very uncomfortable for us. So I think it's just kind of highlighted that there, you know, although I think a lot of work has been done and the scene is more diverse, there are still these kind of old narratives um, floating about, which, you know, makes us feel very uncomfortable and makes me feel uncomfortable, you know, because, well, because of, I think, I guess, partly because of my heritage. Um, so like I say, 50% of the stuff that I'm doing at the moment is, is performance work, but um, the other stuff that I'm doing is, is, is music therapy. 
Um, and through my training, I worked in adult mental health uh, through the NHS. I worked in children's centres. Um, I also worked briefly with uh, Maxwell D also in um, Tower Hamlets in East London, um, working in alternative provision, um, which is you know broadly a, a specialist uh, school for 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 children and young young people who can't access mainstream education or they've um you know they've experienced exclusion so i've been working a lot in those settings but at the moment i'm working in a residential school um, um working with children who've suffered trauma and and, and um you know they have learning disabilities and things like that and they can't access mainstream education and I think in its kind of most basic sense, you know, the way that we're using, I'm using music in a therapeutic sense is to play and to share things with these children and to build a relationship, which I think is at the core of, you know, everything that I do with music and everything that I've experienced. Um, I think one of the last points I probably will, will say though is that, ref, you know, reflecting on my experience of training as a music therapist at the Guildhall, you know, another conservatoire, you know, and this is a, an ongoing thing that um, with with um, an on, ongoing dialogue within the music therapy profession is that there's it's not a very diverse profession and again in my experience of training and and working professionally and working with professional teams in my training it wasn't diverse at all you know and once again there wasn't really anyone who from similar backgrounds to me or um, you know there's no one who kind of who kind of looked like me and i think the music therapy and um, bant who's the british association for music therapy are now doing a survey to try and find out what the demographic of, of music therapists are at the moment. Um, and I think in a profession where we are working with such diverse groups, it, I think it really ought to be, <laughs> in this century, it ought to be a diverse profession, but it, it shows that there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and perhaps some of the work needed to be done 15 years ago, you know, when I started doing music and there needs to be more opportunities for people from all backgrounds to be able to not only get into a music profession, but also, um, yeah, music therapy. Um, so, yeah, it's, as I say, it's an ongoing thing in the music therapy, music therapy world, but um, yes, there's still, still work to be done, I think. Um, I think I'll probably unpick some of the things that I've said, which are maybe not so clear in the discussion, but um, yeah, I hope I've contributed something food, food for thought. Yeah, that, that sounded really, really good. Um, it was very, very interesting. And thank you so much for sharing your background and experiences. Um, so if that's all okay, um, we'll move on to our second speaker of the evening. Um, so our second speaker tonight is uh, Winsome Duncan, uh, she's known by her stage name, Michael uh, Tula, um, and she is, among many roles, a singer-songwriter, author, and radio presenter. Um, she has over 20 years of writing experience and has performed in places such as the Houses of Parliament, Royal Festival Hall, and much to the delight of the average LSE student, Barclays Headquarters. Um, she is a proud winner of the Southwark Culture Award, an accredited mentor, and has worked with young people with special education needs and uh, in pupil referral units, using her creative background to empower and educate. So um, I'll now show a short video of a song titled Marley, um, a tribute to Bob Marley by local healer, um, Winsome Duncan. Some say he was a prophet, everyone they loved 
to plan Each Sunday hit a picture Of a story we'll tell Of people who have longing Eyes wet with shattered dream He's dead but lives forever Music grief and so it seems And uh, that is it. That's the off. Let's start that again. <laughs> Greetings. Good evening, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Hi. You could have been anywhere in the world today, but you've chosen to be here to spend some time with some extraordinary people. I've seen the lineup and I am looking forward to the rest of the speakers. Big up Maxwell D, long time brethren. Right, okay, so um, oh, I'm privileged to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Brooklyn. Thank you, Andrew Camplin. I am lyrical healer today, but on the flyer it says Winsome Duncan. Hello, city. Nice to see you. Long time, long time. So um, I've got a lot to say, so don't feel no way, Brooklyn. Just say uh, time's up and because uh, sometimes I'll just keep going and going but that's what music does to me and that's what music means to me so you did mention that I am a poet and um, that that is right, a spoken word artist, but also a singer as well and a songwriter. And I don't know if it was me and my dodgy internet connection, but it felt like that track was speeding up and, 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 and slowing down and my computer couldn't hear the right tempo. So if anybody experienced that, it is on <laughs> YouTube, so you can go and check it out, Lyrical Healer Molly. And that was actually a single that I released this year uh, to, you know, big up and give thanks and pay homage to a legend that has been instrumental in particular to the reggae music industry worldwide, to all colours and uh, diverse cultures. So we salute you, Mr. Marley, rest in peace. Now, I cannot let this 
opportunity go by without just quickly telling you this now uh so in my hat as Winston Duncan, yes, I am an author. And on the 5th of October, I became a number one best-selling author of The Popcorn House. Boom, boom, boom. Teamwork makes the dream work. And I guess it kind of fits in in terms of, you know, this book represents two black characters. And I got 30 young black uh, well, they say Bane, so Black, Asian, and minority ethnics, bit of a mouthful, to create this book, and we went to number one, and it really is taking traction, um, so I just had to give a shout out to that, because I just think if you're going to do anything, make sure you do it well, and make sure that you do it properly, and it actually features a song in there at the back called Children of the Sun, of which I'm working with, um, uh, Dwayne Patrick from ICANN Studios, he signed to Piers Publishing and we just recorded it this weekend, uh, this weekend gone at Canary Wolf, amazing photo shoot, I definitely recommend, you know, him to you if, if you want to get some, you know, professional shots done, amazing guy and um, he's, you know, worked with all the artists like Gex and, you know, the, the, the grime artist, garage artist, done some work with, um, 50 cents film uh, no series wasn't it uh, power that was it and adidas so it's my privilege to still be working after so many decades max or d knows one i've been in this thing for a minute let's just say two decades so i've made some notes i'm just going to really go go through this uh, uh, first of all i think i just want to say to you that for me music is word sound power it activates me, it heals me, it lights up my soul, you know? I'm a bit anal. When I get a song that I like, bam, it's just on repeat and that's the end of it. I don't wanna hear nothing else. It's just on repeat, on repeat, on repeat. So that's what music does to me. Music can, uh, is a universal language and it really does help people from across the world to come together and to unify in song. So it's, it's very, it's a very key expression, especially now as we're in lockdown in this pandemic times, what we're experiencing is something called a new normal. And as we're beginning to adjust to this new normal, I just think for mental health and for making yourself feel better, the expression of music, poetry, writing, scores, all of those things, is absolutely incredible and you should continue on that journey because it's a healthy thing to do and it's about balancing your mind and where you're at. So recently I've kind of gotten back into my poetry a little bit. I left it because I just wasn't making enough money from it and I didn't have that desire to be a Whitney Houston or a Mariah Carey um you know I've got my unique signature voice there's no one with this voice it's just me so I know that inside of what I do there's an appreciation with for my fans and supporters but one of the things that's never left me is, is even after you know I took off the lyrical healer hat put Winston Duncan on and went into the publishing industry um from since 2006 even though I've done that people are like I still remember seeing you on the stage and that's because it touches them it motivates them and it inspires them so all of you who are training and learning and everything like that um it had for me it has to be in your blood it has to be in your soul it has to be in your blueprint so it is my absolute honour and privilege that you know, a few years back I worked for the people referral, uh, uh, people referral in Tower Hamlets. I worked for several different ones, along with classical pianist um, uh, <laughs> Andrew Camplin. And it's actually funny, Brooklyn. I didn't tell you this, but we've got a song together that I recorded from one of the um, artists. Uh, in school that we were teaching GCSE English. I'll send you that at the end as a little treat. <laughs> it was called Walking by the Sea and it was really good to adapt and change the way I sing. So I'm a soul singer, neo soul's my thing, a little bit of jazz, you know. No, live bands that's really me you know that's my element that's what I love and I think that if I'm honest poetry was always really my first love and it will always be 
but I will die of poetry. You know, that was the thing that just opened the books, opened the music, opened the songwriting. It was the love of words, love of the English language. That's why if you text me and you spell you with the letter and not Y-O-U, <laughs> I'm gonna get vexed because I'm a lover of the English language. So for that period, of time I think Andrew and I worked together for about three years I really sort of was in admiration and I think really Brooklyn we need to work and get him on the honours list for next year his name should really be up there getting his MBEs and OBEs for the contributions that he's given his life and his work and his dedication and the passion that I used to see when we used to go down to um uh, where was it now Trafalgar Square and we used to Covent Garden we used to go and see him and uh, do his orchestra and I'm a lover of most genres of music not really a fan of rock but uh, uh, music is music you know there's certain rocky tunes that I can sort of get with like maybe LinkedIn part but my main thing is soul it's reggae it's uh, I do like pop music as well um garage from back in the day not really a fan of drill either but this is the beauty of it it's everybody's own uni unique way of expressing so as I said before music is universal it opens doors to just amazing opportunities but I do bring a warning and that warning is you know and this is from personal experience yeah try wherever you can not only to get a good deal that is in your favor in terms of contracts and percentages and royalties, but try and own your masters. Try and own your masters. And the reason why I tell you that is because, you know, in I had a, a milestone birthday three years ago and I just decided that I wanted to leave my music on this planet. And I embarked on a project with a guy, you know, uh, from church. It was one of my authors, uncles or whatever. And the sound was beautiful. They understood my voice and we were creating this EP. Marley was one of those from, was one of the tracks from the EP and the EP was called Get Up. And long story short, he took offense to uh, the writer uh, within, within the, the writer that wrote the song Marley, he took offense to one of her comments and then just locked the project off. Never heard from him. It was just tumbleweeds, yeah? Don't know where he's at. I even called him out. But here's the thing. I gave him that power because he was the executive producer on the project and he was paying for everything. And that was a huge, huge lesson for me and what I'm doing in my music to move forward and how I'm falling in love with it again. But nothing before it's time because before Dwayne Patrick and I was deciding to work together, that's been a 10 year period. So everything takes time. And now I think that I've found the right fit and someone that's really gonna understand where I wanna go with this. So really get your lawyers to look over contracts and don't be one of those magicians that just stops because you got bumped in the music industry. If it's your passion, if it's your love, if it's what you're born to do, if it's what you're created to be on this planet, then just be it. Be it when you got a job, be it when you don't got a job, be it when you're happy, be it when you're sad, let it just consume you. You know, that's what music is for me. It is um, something that I listen to every day. As I said, a lot of the time, I'm on repeat, but that's just me. I'm really kind of um, all in if I like something. The other thing that I kind of guess I want to touch on is, you know, we're talking here today about the black experience. I can only share with you my experience and what I've gone through, but the things that I see around urban music and rap music and hip hop music, sometimes perpetuate negative stereotypes of black people that is not pleasing to me and it's not even about whether they use the n-word or not it doesn't even go there it goes more into the dynamics of using music to um or, to create a culture that is not realistic and to create a lifestyle that is out there that uh, uh children want to be like and see and glamorize where it's not um a positive thing for them to do like guns and violence and i'm gonna wet you and whatever the new 
words are uh, in today's uh, current society. So one of the things that disturbs me really is the power of music and how record labels and corporates just really dominate in terms of turning it out. And I was speaking to a poet called Mr. Melise, who actually inspired me to get back my little poetry bug this month. So I've been writing away, <laughs> trying to get back into my swing. And he's saying that, you know, that the children that are commenting on this are like white middle class children and then the black children will go on and they act it out. This hip hop bad man, you know, blah, 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 and all of this foolishness. So um, that's one of the things that does get me a, a, a upset when I think about the black music experience. But on a whole... I personally know a lot of people that are wanting to change it. And a very good friend of mine, the late rapper uh, Ty, also known as Ben Chidoki, was one of those people that was just the music. If you opened up the dictionary, you'd probably like see his face in there. You know, rest in peace. We lost him this year due to, you know, complications of COVID. And that's just what it is. And that's just where we're at. But what I've learned from Ty in particular is that he just became all consuming and he loves samples and he, he just done it to the best of his ability and worked really well with his team and worked across the world. And I said to him, bro, never stop making music, bring another album out, you know, supported all of his works so I guess my time is coming to an end I feel like I got so much more to say <laughs> but I will conclude <laughs> Woo! um and I ain't even had a drink yet this is just like you know green tea that's all I'm sipping on green tea with a straw that's all it is but that's just natural vibes that's what I like to bring into the table you know we're not going to have this moment again so why don't we have some fun so to conclude, really, um, as lyrical healer, I grinded it out. I was on the circuit, what we call poetry circuit, open mic circuit. So I used to just perform just because I wanted to. Didn't know that I could make a career out of it until I went to Soul Food back in, I think it was, let's see, 23rd of February, 2003 was my first ever paid performance. And that was the first time that I was called Lyrical Healer. And I got paid 50 pounds <laughs> for 10 minutes and I did three pieces and it felt like some big money, you know. So um, having that and starting in those routes and realizing that people would pay for services and, and things like that just really sparked my entrepreneurial spirit. So I guess what I wanna say to you is just never give up, be relentless keep grinding and just believe in you even if your parents say oh no 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 you're not going to make it you embarrass me believe in who you are the present is a gift and that is why we are here today because we are all gifts to share our knowledge wisdom and infinite insight i will be back at the question and answer i could go on on. I could go on but I'm not I'm going to be good and I'm going to stick to time so check me out on my socials um I'm everywhere uh, lyrical healer or Winston Duncan uh, Twitter Facebook just everywhere Snapchat <laughs> and it'd be really great to you know uh, uh connect with you thank you thank you thank you Winston Duncan um again another very interesting experience and story um, so now we'll move on to our third speaker, um, Carl Jackson. So Carl Jackson, MVO, is an organist and has been the director of music at the Hampton Court Chapel Royal for over 20 years. He read music at Downing College, Cambridge, where he was an organ scholar and then obtained a teaching qualification from Goldsmith College in London. He has featured on radio and television with the Chapel Choir, notably in the Queen's Christmas Message in 2010 and in two documentaries for BBC4. The, uh, the trailer of one of them will be played shortly. He was appointed MVO in the 2012 New Year Honours list. So please welcome Carl Jackson and a trailer for Queen Elizabeth's Battle for Church Music, featuring his conducting of choral evensong. So I'll share my screen now and show you a two minute trailer. There we go. Oops, it's not this one. Second. 
There we go. This is Choral Evensong. It's a special evening service of music and prayer at the very heart of the Church of England. What I'm listening to now is exactly what you'd have heard when Evensong was in its infancy in the 16th century. Our country's greatest composers from Ray Vaughan Williams to Benjamin Grissom, have all written music for Evensong, the words of which have remained unchanged for nearly 500 years. And it was here, where I work, at Hampton Court Palace, where this tradition was nurtured. It sounds like angels singing, doesn't it? But behind the music, all kinds of nasty things are hidden. There's bloodshed. and martyrdom. And ruthless political maneuvering. As Henry VIII's reformation tore up the Catholic faith England had been ruled by for a thousand years, he replaced it with a new national church. And the music at the heart of worship became a battleground fought over, not just by Henry, but by his successors, Edward and Mary, who drove England to even further extremes, leaving their sister, Elizabeth I, to decide the religious fate of a bitterly divided country. Elizabeth had to fight to keep church music alive at a time when its very existence hung in the balance. This is Elizabeth I's even song. And that is it for the trailer. I'll now hand over to Carl for his segment. Thank you, Brooklyn, and thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, compared to my three co-speakers, co I appear to be the odd one out because I'm in classical music. And I suppose it may be a good idea to find out how I got to be conducting there at Hampton Court in those grand settings. How did it all start off? Um, like Nick, um, I was brought up on the edges of London in northwest London in, in Harrow and like Nick I was um, one of very few people um, who were black both at primary school and at secondary school. Um, I was encouraged by my mum um, because I started to learn the piano um, they realised I had some sort of ear. I think I was dancing around to tunes which were being played on the radio and then there was an old piano at home and I was trying to bash out the tunes and they thought, oh my gosh, yeah, I think he can play the tunes. So I was carted off to have piano lessons and the piano teacher said, oh yeah, there's, there's something there. So we'll try and um, develop that. So I had piano lessons. Um, they went quite well. And then through my school years, I had some encouraging teachers. During that time, I'd managed to win uh, a junior exhibition to the Royal Academy of Music and went there on Saturday mornings. So school career went along, musical career went along. And then um, I began to learn the organ because I joined my local church choir in Harrow um, because a school friend sang in the choir, so I joined the church choir, I was fascinated by the sound of the organ, and then had organ lessons about the age of 16 or so, when um, the time came to think about what was going to happen after school, the idea of going to university came to the fore, in fact it had been 
in my late mother's mind a long, long time ago. I remember when I was sort of 19, 11, she kept saying, I want you to go to university. I, I didn't even know what university was then when I was nine or 10, um, but she was a driving force. So um, I eventually went to university um, as, as, as Brooklyn says, I was an old scholar down in college, enjoyed my three years there. Um, the, uh, I was just concerned with enjoying music and making music. And um, I was fortunate that I wasn't made to feel different because I had a different skin color. Um, there were just a couple of occasions when that occurred when I was at Cambridge, but we all cross over them. But most of the time I was encouraged greatly by my peers and, and by my teachers. After my three years in Cambridge, I took a teaching qualification at Goldsmiths and um, I've had a dual career um, as a school teacher, teaching in secondary schools for um, 36 years, I think it is, and I retired from school teaching three years ago. So um, in the five or so schools I've, I've, I've taught in, um, I feel satisfied that I have helped um, legions of youngsters on their way in music and, and just done my bit. My colour hasn't come into it. I've just been doing music because music is something which inspires one. And uh, that's what I've tried to inspire in all the pupils I've, I've taught in the 36 years. So teachings come to an end. And as you saw there, I've got this other aspect to my career in being a church musician. So I've been at Hampton Court, as Brooklyn says, since um, 1996, and that's 24 years. Um, I've enjoyed it because it's been something which has just touched a musical chord in me. And I think that all stems back to the days from when I was a chorister in my local parish church. Um, so yeah, we've done a lot of good things during the time at Hampton Court. Yeah, we've had radio broadcasts, the TV broadcasts were mentioned and so on and so forth. And we've had a couple of CD recordings, but this is all to do with classical music. And you keep thinking, well, okay, are there many black people in, in classical music? There are, but you don't get to hear about them. And if you haven't done so, I would suggest that you watch the programme about black classical music, which was presented by Susie Klein and Lenny Henry on BBC Four. It's on the iPlayer for another week or so. And the history is there, but nobody has talked about it. Um, we hear about the black trumpeter in Henry VIII's time, John Blank. We learn about um, Bridge Tower and um, Beethoven dedicated a piece to him, the Kreutzer Sonata, but they fell out over a girl, so the dedication was scrubbed through and dedicated to someone else. There are other black classical composers, Ignatius Sancho. The most well-known, I think, is Samuel Coleridge Taylor. And he has a fascinating history. Um, born in Croydon, no, sorry, born in Holborn, lived in Croydon, um, and was encouraged by people. He was encouraged by his teacher at the RCM, the Royal College of Music, Stanford. Um, Sir Edward Elgar, who was a great name in classical music, um, he was asked to write a piece of music. He was too busy, but he said, please give it to Coleridge Taylor. So at the beginning of the 20th century or the end of the 19th century to the beginning of the 20th century, um, where we know that there was great discrimination going on, there were people there who were encouraging talent um, irrespective of the skin color of the person. Um, I'd also, recommend a program which is on Sky Arts. I saw it last night, just, just by sheer chance, program presented by Chichi Vanoke on Samuel Coleridge Taylor. And moving on to Chichi herself, um, 
She is a black classical double bassist. Um, she's played with the orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment for many years. She's a professor at the Royal Academy of Music. And she has said that she's played in orchestras for years and years and years and looked around and thought, where are the black musicians in this orchestra? And as I suspect you may know that she um, founded um, an orchestra, Chineke, which has been in the news for the past three or so years. They've, they've been making great strides. And then we've heard recently of Sheku Kale Mason, who played um, at a recent royal wedding and his siblings as well. So there are stacks and stacks of people who look like me, who have been playing quietly and enjoying music um, quietly. I, if I remember rightly, there is a black contrabassoon player and teacher, Royal, Royal Birmingham Conservatoire, and she plays in the CBSO. We are out there. We are out there, but it just needs to be brought to the fore. And it's a shame that um, classical composers, black classical composers have been forgotten. Coleridge Taylor's music um, was forgotten in the middle of the 20th century, even though when he was alive, um, his most famous piece, High Wolf's Wedding Feast, was being performed at the Albert Hall in huge extravaganzas. And uh, with this resurgence of interest in black classical composers, we learned that there are so many of them. Um, there's Florence Price, um, who was um, a composer whose music has been around, it's been forgotten, but thanks to people like um, Chi Chi, we are um, beginning to be made aware of her music. A couple of days ago, um, I ordered a, an, an organ piece of hers um, this suite for organ because it's a fascinating piece. I heard it on, on YouTube and I want to champion that, that, that music. So um, I'm one of a few people, I suppose, um, who are trying to blaze a trail for black classical music. And um, I hope that this will continue. And I'm pretty sure that with the work of Chineke now that um, this is something which will not go away at all. I think that's as much as I can say for the moment. I've talked about me. Um, yeah, that's it. I, I, I won't say any more. There you are. Ah, okay. Um, th thank you, Carl. Thank you so much um, for, for sharing your experience. Um, it's lovely to have some classical music representation, in my in my opinion. <laughs> um, okay, so finally, and certainly last but not least, I would like to move on to our last speaker, um, Max Wadi. So uh, we have the garage legend known by his stage, known by his stage name as Max Wadi. Uh, he has worked with other big names, such as Ludacris and Miss Dynamite, and has starred in the group Hey As You Go Cartel. Having served time in prison during his youth, Max Wadi has been keen to give back with his music, which he describes as a big turning point for him when he came out. He has mentored prisoners and delivered classes in prisons through his charity, Music Through the Bars. So please welcome Max Wadi. Hey, how's everybody? Hope everyone's good. I want to say, uh, I want to pick up all the speakers that went before me. Um, I want to pick up Winston. Big up Nick Richards, big up Carl Jackson for the classical stuff that was really interesting. Uh, big up yourself, um, Brooklyn Hound as well. Yeah, I just want to say, and Ben, I can't pronounce the name properly, but I want to say it. Ben Honea? Yeah, so anyway, um, thank you, everybody. Um, I go by the name of Maxwell D. Um, you gave a really good description just there of what, I, what I've been doing in the last, um, say, in the last two years. Um, but my journey, my history comes from. 20 years back now, it's funny enough, it's been a long time. When I say 20 years, it sounds absolutely mental to me, but um, I've been doing this since a young kid. Um, I'm 41 now, and I started in the music industry because of my father. Um, he was a well-known um, reggae DJ on um, Choice FM, uh, Kiss FM at the time. And so he used to bring me to like Notting Hill Carnival when I was like 10, and I used to put me in front of like thousands and thousands of people on the big festival stages like that and play music, reggae music with him. So that's how I started to get into the industry. 
the artist side of it was I used to watch a lot of um, Jamaican stage show tapes, um, like Sting, Reggae, Sunsplash and stuff like that. So then I started idolizing a lot of the artists on the stage, which would be at the time, would be uh, my generation were like, before, even before Shabba Ranks came in, it would be like artists that you might not have heard of, like Papa San, Lieutenant Stitchy, Admiral Bailey, Yellow Man, a lot of people might have heard of. And I grew up on those kind of people and it developed into dance and culture. And I followed that a lot in, as my dad was playing a lot of that music. And living with my dad, going back and forth, my dad had so many records in his bedroom that had vinyl everywhere. So my, my head where I was living was just covered in vinyl. So every day I'd get up and put vinyl on the, on the decks and stuff. So I fell in love for music as a, literally living it, breathing it with my dad. And um, what really made it real for me was um, they started a thing in the UK, which was called Drum and Bass Jungle. And Jungle had re reggae slash ragga samples in it. So that drew me into it straight away, which then interpreted a UK culture, which is of movement. It wasn't just like, you know, the music. It was about what you wore, you know, what you said. It was like a whole shift. I could identify myself with these people. It was very underground. You know, a lot of stuff were, to listen to this stuff, you had to, you know, tune into a radio station and, you know, be in your school playground or in your colleges and stuff like that. But it wasn't like on the TV screens. So um, growing up into it, I was, you know, fell to a lot of street life, crime. I was, you know, had a lot of um, trauma from childhood, poverty, growing up in bad areas, um, Peckham, you know, hanging, going to school in Brixton, you know, heavily growing up in you know, rural areas like Leighton and Hackney and stuff like that. So I fell to the street life, um, you know, I was doing a whole lot of crime and I ended up going to prison. But at the same time, before I went to prison, I was, you know, still doing a little bit of the MC and stuff on house parties and radio stations and all sorts of stuff. Um, funny enough, before I quickly go into the prison thing, because I can talk forever. I have 20 years of knowledge to give you, but I can't. I have to chop it down quickly. So I would say that my college friends are people that you might have heard of today, which was uh, who I started my group with, which is called Page Go Cartel, which is a garage group that um, we come out with. And in that group, there was a lot of members that are doing really well today that um, consist of the Godfather of Grime, who you know had a lot of contro controversy recently, which is Wiley, um, head of One Extra and the Radio One and stuff like that, DJ Target. Um, genius who managed KEB and owns Rinse Firm Station um, and loads more come from us, DZ Rascal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this goes on and this goes on. So that's who I know from college. And I ended up in prison, um, come out of prison. I decided that I wasn't going to go back. Um, so I decided that I needed to, you know, change my life. I still was a bit on the street for a little bit, but I ended up meeting back up with my college friends, which was Wiley, et cetera, and stuff. And we had ended up going onto a radio station and doing a show. And then we started becoming really popular amongst our area and around town. And yeah, I started going to the studio and I made a track called Serious. And before I knew it, the following year later, I was like literally on um, T4, Channel 4, all over the holiday islands, Cyprus, all over the place, just everywhere, traveling, performing this track. And this track made me very popular. And that was my introduction to the music industry. And, you know, our group, which is Page Go, Wiley and the rest of us, we then went further on into the charts, had a number 13 in the national UK charts. Um, my track, Serious, debut, uh, debut um, 38 in the national charts. And my career started, you know, I, I started working with overseas international artists like Ludacris, as you said earlier on, um, work with most of the UK artists in, in this country today. Um, and yeah, I decided that um, music was my passion and my love and my drive. Um, I want to kind of keep it to about, uh, as well, add on the Black History Month, how, how hard it was being uh, a young Black guy from the street, you know, very uneducated at the time you know, very, you know, naive and stubborn and very traumatized with a lot of, you know, stuff that I went through in my childhood, coming into the music industry and not being able to kind of um, network and do business with with people that I have not come from that background was, was, was challenging. 
you know, people would label you as, a, you know, gang, crew, fog, black, you know, this is typically looking to expect to see the, ah, I'm, I'm from the street, I'm going to give you X, Y, Z. But um, I, I, I kind of learned very fast, you know, of that, not just because, you know, you see people wearing suits and ties doesn't necessarily mean that they're good people. So I had to learn about the business side of the music industry throughout the years. Um, I had a good run. I'm not saying that the run finished, but I had a really good run. And then, you know, as any business, you have your highs and lows. And in the music career, I had a lot of highs and lows. Um, but it served me well. It tra I traveled around the world. And I think I got to a point halfway in my career where I decided that I wanted to give back. I decided that I wanted to get involved in, you know, seeing uh, the, lot, the kids that where I come from, not just my area, just people like myself, giving them an opportunity to actually experience, even if it's a little fraction of what I experienced in my lifetime, because music absolutely turned my life around 360. So I thought if I could give that opportunity to other people, then, you know, that would be great. And it, will, it felt good in my spirit and my soul. I just felt like it was more to than just, you know, being a star. It wasn't just about, oh, everyone look at me, look at me, I want to take, take, take. It was about actually, I want to make stars. I want to make, you know. So I decided that um, halfway through my career, I wanted to get involved in a lot of charities. I found my first charity that I got involved was um, Kids Count. And it put me in places of Houses of Parliament with David Cameron and giving speaks about broken society. Then I started working for another organisation called Foundation for Life, where I became a behaviour consultant and I started doing a lot of mentoring. And that kind of you know, transpired throughout the years. It was something I was doing behind the scenes. Um, I also would like to say that um, I was still pursuing my music career. I started getting into another lane of music, which was getting my songs in movies. And I have a, my, one of my best friends from Los Angeles who, you know, works very closely with a lot of music producers and music supervisors in Hollywood, um, brought me in that world. And so my first song score, major score in a movie was Ted, Mark Wahlberg with the teddy bear. So I had a track in that movie called Soldier when actually Mark Wahlberg's on the phone to, to the teddy bear and we're flash, he's saying Flash Gordon's in the house and they play my song in the background. So um, I started getting into that world. So what brings me forward to today with the movies, with the chart success, with you know, being a crew to, to introduce grime music to the to the nation because um, we didn't know what we was doing. We didn't know what our sound was. We didn't even have a name for it. I think, you know, grime just came because maybe someone thought, oh, these kids look grimy. <laughs> All these kids thought, you know, the music sounds really grimy. But yeah, that's what we done and that's what we delivered. So bring, what brings me fast forward today where, I, you know, I bumped into people like Nick and stuff like that was uh, I decided that I, I didn't just want to you know, work with charities. I actually wanted to run my own workshops myself. So I decided to um, create my own um, company, my own workshop called Music Through the Bars. And Music Through the Bars is amazing because it, not only do I get to go into prisons and teach, you know, people where I've, you know, I've been into prison myself. So it was, it was amazing even to go back, you know, years later to be the other person on side of the prison gate, actually trying to help people like myself once upon a time. So it was like a crazy full cycle walking into a prison, delivering a workshop. But the, it was so amazing because I don't just give them the music side of it. I actually give them the business side of it. And I also give them a side of it where they can see that, you know, it's just actually about the knowledge of understanding. You're not, not necessarily, oh, I need money. I need this, I need that. I actually give them the knowledge and understand the things behind the scenes. So they, it's basically given um, normal people that want to get into music tools to help them progress basically and and, it, and of course really went well and then I ended up working in a school which was like was really close to my heart because working in school as you know you know seeing kids on a daily basis you get really attached as in like you know they it's like sir 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 and they see me as a um they're really young so they, they're hearing about me for the first time maybe oh sir is it true that you you got a video on YouTube and I'm like, YouTube, like I've been going way longer than YouTube, but hi, great. So yeah, and um, I just, it was really a great experience working in a school with kids and I, and I really got to home in on their talent. I really got to give them some opportunity and I've been doing my thing for a while. So recently, just yesterday, this week, my my uh, one of my first singles that I came in with the game, which was called Serious, 
Um, we just relaunched it um, again with Motown UK Universal. Um, we just dropped the video yesterday. I just premiered it, premiered it on BBC One Extra yesterday with DJ Target. And absolutely, it's been a full cycle. That is the soundtrack to a new grime movie that we're bringing out on November the 13th called Against All Odds. So please look out for it. Posters, billboards have been up this week as well. So yeah, I'd just like to say that's who I am. That's what I've done in a short, short frame of trying to give a, a speak in a short thing. But I hope you um, like understood, enjoyed it. Um, and I was clear and you could you know, get where I'm coming from. But thank you, yes, for having me. <laughs> Oh, excellent. Um, thank you, Max Wadi. Thank you so much for, um, again, sharing your experiences. Um, so, yeah, that concludes our speaker segment. Um, I hope all of you have really, really enjoyed the insights and their personal experiences that, that they've all had to offer. So, again, a huge thank you to all four of our speakers. Um, so, and on this note, I do hope that all of you in, uh, and if I may say, including the speakers um, yourselves, that you have many questions to ask um, each other and, and to the speakers, uh, because genuinely what they've shared with us in the past hour has been so varied, so diverse, and so personal as well. Um, so I would like to kick off the Q&A. Um, you're more than welcome to type your questions into the chat, uh, or you can, uh, you can use the raise hand function um, if I... Oops. Yeah, you should be able to use the raise hand function. Um, I, I will chair the Q&A and I'll try to take a mix of typed questions and um, or, or um, ask participants to ask the questions themselves. Uh, again, do bear in mind that this event is being recorded, um, but please don't be shy. Uh, do ask lots of questions. So let the chat show us your raise hand icons. So we'll just wait for the first question to come in. Okay, we have a question from Anessa Chan. Hello, uh, can everyone hear me? Okay, cool. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank everyone for giving us your time today and to come speak with us. Um, it was really interesting to hear from everyone's experiences and to kind of find out the similarities and differences in working in different parts of the music industry. Uh, so I've actually got a question for um, like each individual speaker, but I won't take up everyone's time. So I'll just ask my first one. Um, and this question is for Carl. Um, so, um, do you have any tips for a beginner choir director? So um, I'm currently the leader of my own a cappella group, uh, which I know is not exactly the same as choir, but it's my first year as the official director. And I was wondering if you have any words of wisdom for us? Oh, any words of wisdom? Um, I think the most important thing for any director or and have a clear idea in your mind as to how you want the music to sound. And then you work with your group to achieve that sound. It may not always happen. It doesn't because we are human but you've got to have in your mind an idea of how. That's the first thing. Um, the other thing is um, just ensuring that one's beat, one's direction is, is, is clear and concise. The smaller the beat, the better, the more... Two things. Thank you so much. I'll definitely keep these in mind when okay. I have my sessions in the future. Good luck. Uh, any more questions? Uh, please don't be shy. Nobody be shy. <laughs> Ah, we have a question in the chat from Ben Panaya. So do you have any tips for songwriters in terms of getting their work heard by the right people? Uh, is this for all the speakers? Um, 
yes, we'll, um, yeah, we'll just ask all the speakers to take turns answering if, if that's good. So anyone like to go? I'll kick off. Hello. Hi. So I, want, I would say your network is your net worth. That's the key thing. And what you've got to do is build relationships and have a genuine interest in what people are doing and always think about how you can give something to them or help them in their journey and their quest. The traditional kind of method is, oh, you got a demo, you send it to the record office, which they just put on the pile of other demos and nobody ever listens to it. So that would kind of be the hardest way to go about it. But if you can generate your following and a fan base on Instagram, on YouTube in particular with its visuals and they can see you, then that would be a good place to start and always use your hashtags because people can find you and what you're doing uh, musically. But I think you really do have to persevere when it, when, it, when it comes to delicate thing. And, you know, it's hard to get into the industry. <laughs> Let's just face it, that's the fact is challenging it's not to say you can't but it's hard uh have somebody represent your music yourself um but very just very quickly uh carl i just want to say to you it's the black experience thank you thank you thank you very much for that Yeah, so to, uh, about the songwriting tips and stuff like that, I just want to quickly, um, I just saw it, right, so, okay, my mind went blank for a second. Um, so about the songwriting tips, I say that what I would do personally, or how it's been for me, as find, it's all, yeah, as you said, network and network, so I would say find out the right people in the right department for, so I wouldn't, songwriters, I would want to go more around to popular studios, you know, um, finding out publishers, who publishes what records, and just basically join, and join um, PRS music unions and stuff like that. They also have regular additional information about songwriting and stuff like that. It's kind of hard because you can say do this and do that and do this and do that, but it's it's all going to boil down to as your, as your crowd, who you're moving with, where you are, because you could be I don't know, hanging around with a, a with uh, I don't know, a, a, a classical guys that do classical, and then and then somebody down in has a totally different network to do something else. So it's it's kind of hard. It's just like what you're trying to say is that the tips all I can give to you is just network with as much people as possible. Yeah, that's all. That's the thing I can say. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that as well. I, I think also with, I think you should ask yourself, what do you want to get from approaching a label? You know, be very specific about, you know, do you want more coverage? Do you want, you know, more likes on social media? Or, or you know, what, what is it you really want? If you do decide that you want to go to a label, have the whole product finished, like have the album pretty much there and have your, you know, your high res pictures and the whole concept together. Because unfortunately, they're gonna look at it like a commodity. <laughs> they're gonna try and sell it like, uh, like a product. So you, yeah, I guess going back to that question, like really think about what you want to get from going to a label, because it's precious. These are your, this is your goals. This is so important. Um, this is important material for you, so it's, um, yeah, I'd say be careful and just be clear about what you want to get. But also think about doing it yourself. The amazing thing about the internet these days is that, you know, you know, like Winston was saying, you know, have all your hashtags, you know, get on the Twitter, get on, you know, get on all these uh, different websites and things like that and share your music through there. Because you, 
quite often they're they're the places now that people are doing most of their marketing or they're pushing their songs or you know so i think a lot of the stuff people can do themselves um i think my band do have a kind of um we have a company who helps us to kind of push things onto radio and stuff like that um so i think some some relationships and some connections are good but then there's a lot of stuff that you can be doing yourself you know for quite a while but keep it keep yeah. it to yourself as much as you can because it's precious it's your it's your treasure nick has said precisely what i was going to say use the internet exploit the internet and use those connections soundcloud post post links just use those links on the internet facebook everything because you can do it yourself now 20 or 30 years ago you you didn't have the facility to advertise yourself but you can do it now to everybody that's the best way to do it Thank you very much. Um, very, very invaluable advice from all four of you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, any other questions? I'll give it a couple of seconds, but I have a question myself I would like to ask as well, but just waiting if anyone else has any questions. I think Anessa said that she had questions for all of us. Should yeah. we see what, she, what, what the other questions were? Yeah, sure. I don't want to hog everyone's question time, <laughs> but I, I guess I could ask more. Um, I guess I'll, I'll pick the question that universal language and that you really love, I guess, the English language itself. So I had to ask, which is a possibly controversial question, but are you a lyrics more important than melody kind of person or the other way around? Oh man, gosh. How long have we got? I've never been asked that question before. I've got to scratch my head. Um, are lyrics or melody? So how I write is I'd get a melody first. So it might be a and I think, okay, what goes with that? Where is my love? Something like that. That's so definitely the melody girl for me. Obviously, lyrics are important. Um, I can't just sit down and write a song without knowing the vibe of it if that makes sense. So yeah, don't know what it's like for other people. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah, I... Can I just jump in here and say that from my decades of experience of teaching in the classroom and GCSE and compositions, each person is different. Some people will start with the lyrics, others will start with the music. You do what is suited to you that there is no right way. Each person will approach the task of making music in a different way. Some do lyrics, some do the music. Some will have that idea as um, Winsome had there. Da, 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 and it's there. Thank you so much for your answers to my question. <laughs> I know it's a bit kind of out of the blue. Great. Um, are there any more questions? If not, I'm just going to cut in with one quick question. This is for Nick. Um, if not the saxophone, which instrument would you have picked up instead? Um, actually, my first instrument was still pans. Um, because before... Um, yeah, I was playing still pan, so maybe I'd still be doing that. I don't know, maybe something like that. Or I think, think I would, I'd always be singing because my dad was always singing around the house. And um, even now, I'll just sing around the house. I'm, I, I guess I'm singing professionally. 
but um, I've been singing all my life. And I think, I see like when I heard Winston singing there and just kind of vibe, you know, vibing off a, an idea, that's how I compose a lot of my music. And, you know, with the saxophone and with jazz improvisation, we spend hours and hours and years and years basically trying to become one with our instruments. So what's in here and what's in here is flying out the horn. So, um, yeah, I always try and sing because it really, it's ideas and things like that. So I always try and generate my initial ideas through my voice, I guess. So I guess singing would, would be the one. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we have a question from Andrew Campling. Um, yes, can you hear me? You, you, you can? Yep, okay, great. No, th thanks for the inspiring narratives. And I, I happen to know uh, two or three of the speakers, which, which, and it's fantastic to see you and, and hear what you've had to say. Um, and I, do, I found the narratives really inspiring. Um, I think I myself am a classical musician and uh, it, it always has been of concern to me that when I hire an orchestra um, of freelance musicians, um, very often there are not that many um, people of, who are particularly to Carl, but, but to, all, to all of the speakers, is how we can um, change that. Now, Carl talked about Chineke and it, the fantastic group and they, they're trailblazers. But I, it, it'd be wonderful to think of other ways in which we can encourage very talented young black people to consider classical music as, as, as a possible career. So Carl, do you, do you have any further thoughts on that? Um, I'd be very interested to hear them. Gosh, um, how to encourage young black people to be involved in classical music. I think it depends on the opportunities available at their school. Some people go to schools where there's lots of music going on. And um, if there's a teacher there who inspires music, irrespective of the skin color of the kids, and if those kids can be encouraged to go on with their music, it, it all rests on schools now, I think. And it's a bit of a lottery because there's some good work going on in some schools with others, they're falling prey to cuts and the need to concentrate on the so-called, so-called important subjects. Music is important for God's sake. <laughs> could, could I come back to that? And uh, I, I totally agree with what Carl has said. And I do think that, uh, again, rather sadly, as I book musicians, I'm quite aware sometimes that a lot of them have had the privilege of private education uh, rather than um, going to a state school. And I think Carl's absolutely right. I think the general cuts uh, to um, the budget for music in schools uh, and not only just music is, is deeply concerning and it, it has had a, had a knock on effect. Um, but um, I don't think one should be too pessimistic. And uh, you know, there are examples of fantastic teaching of music in state schools. And uh, let's hope that in the, you know, 20 years time rather more black musicians are being being booked for, yeah. you know, ad, lib, um, ad hoc, um, and not only ad hoc, but actually, you know, big events involving classical orchestras. I don't know whether Nick would have something. I know Nick has an interest in the classical world as well. So Nick, would you like to throw in a few thoughts there? Um, I, I think um, a word that Axel D um, said was giving back you know, giving something back. And I think that's so important. Um, it sounds like everyone on the panel we've spoken today has got to a point in their, their career where they felt they need to give something back, you know, um, whether it be, you know, musical, um, music lessons or tuition. I think for me, it's been the music therapy, which maybe is something slightly different. Um, it's, it, it's really difficult. It's, it's difficult to say, and I think it's something that affects people from all backgrounds. But I think with classical music and instrumental music and, and jazz, 
um, you know, you need that one-to-one -one tuition. Yeah. You need an instrument. Right? And if there's not things like that, which are going to be run by government or charities, then it's going to be quite difficult. You know, I, you know, I, I've, you know, I found the, the music industry quite difficult. Um, I've enjoyed my career, but um, I've also been quite privileged to be able to, to train and to become a music therapist, you know, and to have those one-to-one -one lessons and, and to have, have an instrument, you know? So I think, and that's something that will, that affects everyone. And I think, um, I think, you know, as a culture in, in this country, I think we need to kind of, kind of think about, you know, in a broader sense, how can we get people to access more music, you know, and there needs to be more money for an hour, you know, more, more, you know, now more than ever, you know, because it's just so important. Um, and I think, I don't think that's necessarily just for classical. I think that's classical music and, and perhaps jazz, which are traditionally kind of taught through years and years of one-to-one -one tuition or, you know, yeah. that's just how they've been taught, you know. And it requires it really, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm. Just one um, code, as it were. Um, one needs to be aware also of the good work being done with some music hubs um, throughout the country and also um, places like the Centre for Young Musicians here in London. So there is, there are pockets of good work going on yeah. where there are black musicians. Of and that continue. Indeed, absolutely. I, I was going to say something. Um, about the classical stuff. Hi, Andrew, I hope you're okay. Um, Very well, thank you. I was going to say that I think with the classical stuff, I think the reason why a lot of it's, um, we might see in a bit side of that, a lot of black people are not involved in it, a lot of other cultures are not involved in it. I think we trace where classical music's like the origins of classical music and what it's being portrayed in the films. A lot of classical music, I've always seen it in a lot of old and age films and where there's a lot of white people, maybe a lot of slave masters and stuff like that. So I've always, always assumed classical music to be like, you know, never, it's been not been appealing, because not because of the sound, it's just been not been appealing because of what it's been represented with, you know? It's never, I've always thought Beethoven was, oh, like, you know, I've, I've watched certain films and I'm just drawn by the film because of the, classical pool of the strings and stuff like that but as as the actual culture itself I've never could identify myself to it because I didn't see none of my peers or anybody in it and I think that's the mold that needs to be broken I think there should be a new a young black Beethoven in the 20 you know in the 21st century I don't see why not I just think that if we need to break this, this stereotype and just look what it's come from and how we look at it so we may be you might need to introduce it more into the schools where we got rap and cl rap classical or drill classical or you know they need to, they need to collaborate more with other um, strands of music genres of music to get the other audiences airs in it and that way to seem it's cool like just like rap is just like you know um, every any other music is it's just the kind of change in the narrative where it's it's the culture behind it if if the lot of the people see more young black guys with the you know, orchestra and the, the, the actual classical, they would think, whoa, look at this young black guy on the stage doing that. I didn't think it was possibly done. We you always see an old white guy doing it, like ordering everyone around. And I think if we can get that across to our, 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 the next generation and, and the other diversities of culture, I think that will make classical music open up because it's not the sound, like music is music. There's some, like I could really sit back and have a chilled evening listening to classical music. Not do I do it? No, I don't. But I know I could if I if I really wanted to because classical music is soothing. It's like, you know, and I do know some certain riffs and I'm always going to look to sample some things. We go to classical strings to sample. So it's a great music. We just need to identify it with in, in the right way. So yeah, that's what I would say to that. So thanks, Andrew. No, I, I think you made some excellent points there of the, the cultural appropriation in, in certain uh, past historical cases of that. 
Uh, but I think you're absolutely right. When we see people like Wayne Marshall, fantastic organist, and you know, Carl, I'm sure knows, uh, you know, being trailblazing and being excellent uh, kind of mentors and uh, role models, really. Uh, and that that's, you know, so in 20 years time, maybe it'll be far more diverse. And I, one really hopes it will be. And please, please do watch that program presented by Lenny Henry and Susie Klein on BBC Four. It really is a revelation. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you all so much. This is definitely a very meaningful topic to, to have discussed. And it, it's really great that everybody contributed and added something truly valuable to, to this discussion. Um, now it's um, 7.40. I was just thinking it's a good time to wrap up. Um, just wondering uh, for the speakers whether there's any sort of final remarks you guys want to say within a minute or so each um, and what your next sort of directions are. Is it ladies first? Sure, why, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I feel a little bit dominated, uh, but I can hold my own. Miracle healer. Um, okay, so uh, <laughs> I think one of my thoughts is I think it would be really cool to do an experiment and fuse with our four different sounds and see something of interest to anyone. <laughs> of the speakers here. Um, <laughs> cool. Hey, closing remarks are thank you for putting on something like this because I didn't even know it was going to go on YouTube after and the audience that listen to my work need to see that we're being supported our artistry is being respected, our voices are being heard. We're, listen, we're living in a very different season. I do believe it's a season of transformation, but nevertheless, it is a new normal. And as long as we can continue to, to, to change this dialogue, not just a Black History Month, because my history is 365 years, not put into one month. But to continue on, the, uh, that's really my thoughts. It, this, I thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, thank you. I think it's a shame that it's taken an event in America to raise the consciousness about the contribution of Black people in so many ways and in classical music. And um, okay, it, 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 it was a sad catalyst, but it started something. And I hope that that will continue, really. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think this kind of, with all the difficulties that, you know, COVID has brought and the lockdowns that we're all experiencing and, you know, the effects it's had on our craft and the, the music industry, I think that's been, that's been in, that's been incredibly difficult, but I think it's given us all a um, opportunity to stop and observe and think and reflect and see and question what's been going on and how can we improve things. And I think a lot of people think, well, you know, can we after this is all over, can we create a more positive world? You know, what would we want it to look like? So, um, so yeah, I think these kind of discussions are all part of that, you know, and I, th and I totally agree with Winston. This is something that needs to be going on every day, you know. It's just a, a narrative that just needs to be, keep going, and um, it shouldn't just be um, confined to, to one month, you know. Yeah. But, yeah, and also, everyone stay safe. <laughs> look after each other, you know, and keep making music. Mm. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, um, I'll say next time. I might, okay, I'm gonna talk. <laughs> okay, I would like to say before I go, um, 
Um, thank you to everybody that come out today to speak. It was really interesting. I heard a lot of different stories. I heard a lot of different artists and different points of view as well today. I would like to say, um, yeah, more stuff like this needs to be done. Um, I come from a completely different world and we, we do different stuff, but stuff like this where it's mixing up different people with different ideas and different points of views is very important because you know you get to learn. That's the main thing, leaving here with something, um, understanding. And with this, um, with the community, with the culture and with, you know, all of us as artists and musicians, I think is, um, I think to say that music is a way of life. I think, you know, I think music for me and for all of us has kept us going. It's something that whether, you know, you made a pound or you made a million pound, it's something that was always going to keep your heart beating and it will always put you in so many different places and, 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 and find a way for you to, to make an income or whatever, it doesn't matter, whatever it is. So I would always say that um, don't let anything get in the way of, of what you truly believe inside. And it doesn't matter how long and how, how long, you know, because I would rather, you know, try my whole life becoming and doing what I love than sitting down and being miserable and, you know, being upset for something that I once upon and wished I could have done. So I'll just leave that with everybody to just keep following whatever they're pursuing in life. Because I'm telling you, if I am not the proof of the pudding that it can be done, then I don't know what else is. And so, um, yeah, please, please. And I look forward to anyone wanting to, to um, hit me up afterwards or, you know, my contact details are here. I'm always up for, you know, interesting and networking with new people. So please, please uh, don't be shy. Thank you. Thank you so much to, to everyone. Um, uh, hello? Zoom, Zoom's just telling me my internet connection is unstable. Um, I, I hope it hasn't let, let us down during this session. But thank you so, so much to every, every, every one of you. This has been really, really inspirational. And I hope to all the participants that you've all, you've all asked plenty of excellent questions. And I hope you've all had something amazing to take away from this. So I think this wraps up our event. Um, again, huge thank you to our wonderful speakers for the time. Um, huge thank you to our participants for asking some very, just purely curious and very interesting questions um, to stimulate some very meaningful discussions tonight. Um, a bit of a shameless plug from me. Um, next month, the LSESU Music Society will be holding a Wine Down Wednesday event um, with a focus on mental health uh, which what we believe of being unpre of a unprecedent, unprecedented, I'm, I'm mixing up my words, unprecedented importance in these socially distanced times. Um, so there will be a very fun quiz, um, which may or may not feature memes, jokes, uh, and just casually socializing and chatting with music streaming in the background. Um, so do come and rest your minds. And um, before I go, I just wanted to show this. Come rest your minds with us, um, for need of a better pun, um, as the time slowly draws to close. Uh, thank you all very much and take care. Thank you and give it up for Brooklyn, great host. Hey. Hello, everyone. Bye, bye everybody. Woo, woo. Woo. Cheers. Take care. Thank you.